Um, good afternoon and welcome to the John Curtin Gallery. Uh, my name is Samantha Smith. I'm the John Curtin Gallery's Communications Coordinator and I mostly look after the public program. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Wajat Noongar people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today, and to pay my respects to their elders um, and ancestors past and present. Thank you so much for coming out on such a hot day. I, I have not experienced it because I've been inside all day, but um, I believe it's about 40 degrees or something by now. So well done. I hope that coming here will be really lovely and cool and, and you won't want to leave. That would be good. <laughs> so uh, today we are here to talk about sense and sensitivity. This beautiful exhibition is the result of a unique multidisciplinary collaboration between Simon Phillips and Dawn Joy Leon, who have partnered to marry a series of stunning photographic landscapes by Phillips with Leon's poetic soundscapes. It also forms part of a new collaboration between researchers from Curtin Centre for Culture and Technology and the Curtin Autism Research Group in a celebration of neurodiverse creativity. I am delighted to welcome Curator of Sense and Sensitivity, Dr. Suzanne Ingelbrecht from the School of Media, Creative Arts and Social Inquiry here at Curtin. As, a curator, as the curator, Suzanne is responsible for the different elements and layout of the exhibition, as well as the audiovisual artistic direction. And I think if you have seen the exhibition, you'll agree it's absolutely beautifully put together and collated. Today, Suzanne will talk about the exhibition the artistic collaboration between the artists and the research behind it. Um, at the end of her talk, there will be a video um, concluding the, the talk, which has mild references to anxiety and suicide. Um, so without further ado, I will hand you over to Suzanne for the talk. Thank you. Kaya, and thank you, Sam. Um, so my name is Dr. Suzanne Ingelbrecht, and as Sam has told you, I'm from the School of Media, Creative Arts and Social Inquiry here at Curtin University, and I'm also the curator of Sense and Sensitivity. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land upon which we meet, the Wajak Buja of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects to elders past present and emerging. Welcome to all of you for what is a first at the John Curtin Gallery. The first time that an exhibition of creative excellence exclusively by artists identifying as autistic has been hosted here. I hope that sense and sensitivity won't be the last time you get to experience the work of talented neurodiverse artists, both from Australia and from overseas, pandemics and travel restrictions allowing, of course. <laughs> As you look around here today, you will, I hope, notice some aspects that are a bit different from a usual exhibition experience at the JCG. Firstly, you might notice that the signage is, in general, at a lower height than it normally is to enable, uh, to enable individuals in wheelchairs a more acceptable vantage point from which to read words and text about the exhibition. The text itself, you might notice, is in a clearer, larger font size than usual to better enable visually impaired people to take in information about the exhibition. Each of the magnificent portrait-sized prints over here by Simon Phillips has a QR code label through which neurodiverse or visually impaired people may listen to audio descriptions about the work. There's a sensory cues script available at reception of all the moving visual and audio cues of the magnificent 20 minute audio visual untitled collaboration in the South Gallery so that anyone who needs to knows exactly what to expect from the work. And in the event that someone is sensorially overloaded, there is a calm space 
down the corridor in what would normally be a university lecture theatre for neurodiverse people to recover, indeed for anyone to sit and simply chill. It's a respite from the insistent, busy world that pulses and pushes in all around us. I'd like to pay tribute to my colleagues at the Curtin Autism Research Group and the Centre for Culture and Technology, in particular to Emily Darcy and Jordan Fife for the awesome work that has gone into the accessibility elements of this exhibition. Indeed, all the hours of work that has gone into making this exhibition the truly inspiring gift that it is. Sense and sensitivity honours the importance of accessibility and inclusivity for everyone. For audience members and artistic creators, and it implicitly says to us that artistic practice shouldn't only be the domain of those who have the money, cultural background, and able-bodiedness to follow their dreams. It says to us that accessibility is not just about making the physical and material environment around us conducive for people with disability. It's crucially about giving opportunity to people with disability so that they can follow their dreams and their passions, find meaningful work, and to participate fully in all aspects of society. So this exhibition celebrates opportunity. The opportunity for two mid-career autistic artists from two different countries to showcase their work in front of you, to show how they see and hear and touch the world, to showcase the unassailable fact that autistic creativity and autistic feeling exists in the world. And that through that sensitivity, we too can sense what autistic artists feel, understand its multifaceted nature, how richly diverse it is. Ward et al. make the point that synesthesia, which is the phenomenon of perception expressed via one sensory or cognitive pathway being experienced via another pathway, is more common among autistic than non-autistic people. The phenomenon means heightened perception around one or more of the senses. And it means that the shared language autistic individuals find to express their heightened perceptiveness isn't necessarily the language of words or written text. It may be color or movement or sound or the tactile softness of fur against skin. Their creativity allows autistic artists to speak to us in sensory languages not the normative practice of verbalization, but the languages of visualization, sound, touch. These sensory languages challenge the often pervasive public view of autism as lack or deficit or disorder. On the contrary, they're the languages of detail and depth and meaning. But how on earth did these two autistic artists with differing sensorial sensitivities who have, who have never met in person come together for an exhibition here at the John Curtin Gallery when one of them doesn't even live here? It wasn't easy, let me tell you. Um, so we've had this pandemic to contend with for 22 months and counting. This mysterious coronavirus's arrival as a health crisis was heralded by the World Health Organization on January the 9th, 2020. More than 262 million infections later and over 5 million deaths, according to the Johns Hopkins University Corona Resource Center, and of course now this new 
Omicron variant to contend with, and it's clear COVID-19 will be with us for years to come. We here in Western Australia have been more fortunate than most other jurisdictions of the world. We've known just one month-long period of restrictions between March and April 2020, and we've had just two sharp lockdowns this year, one in January and one in June. We've largely been able to go about our normal business unaffected, and that's meant being able to gather in public places, have dinner out, visit cinemas, theatres, and of course galleries. For most of us here in Western Australia, the COVID-19 pandemic has simply meant the need to adjust our habits, to wash our hands, maintain a bit of social distancing. But for people in other countries, it's been much, much more serious. It's been more serious, for example, in Singapore, where Dawn Joy Leong lives and works. Singapore, like WA, was very quick to bring in lockdown and social distancing measures when COVID-19 first hit, but community complacency took over, particularly as vaccination levels in the city-state climbed over the 80% mark. Now, for an individual like Dawn Joy, who is immunocompromised as well as neurodiverse, the COVID-19 pandemic has, a need, has entailed a need for her to be hypervigilant around isolation and separation from other people in order to protect herself from COVID. She and her sound engineer, Karen Lowe, hardly left their apartments in the creation of the 10 sensory stories that make up the 20 minute audio visual collaboration that's the signature highlight of Sense and Sensitivity. That is an extraordinary feat in and of itself because Dawn and Karen weren't able to go to a properly resourced sound studio to record and master their soundscapes. For most of us, us this enforced need to isolate for your life and for your art might sound devastating. However, for the neurodiverse or autistic artist, enforced isolation may not only be necessary, but also creatively beneficial. As you will shortly hear, Simon Phillips benefits from his solitary sojourns into the Western Australian landscape. The city for Simon can be sensorially overwhelming, but in nature, he can hyper-focus freely on colour, on texture, see extraordinary detail that pass others by and meticulously plan the shot he is going to take to the minutest pixel. Time becomes meaningless, lost in the creative urge to capture what he has set up in his mind's eye. Sorry, this is, so I'm trying to move the. Simon will wait and wait and wait to take the perfect shot. Sometimes he does not succeed but very often, as you can see from these prints behind me and in the audiovisual collaboration in the South Gallery, he does. And the results are breathtaking. When I came into this neurodiversity project as curator five months ago, the intention was to create an exhibition that gave a public platform to Simon's work within the built environment of an art gallery. Of course, you can already see Simon's work on the internet. On Instagram, he has over 100,000 followers. But this art gallery environment gave people the opportunity of seeing Simon's work at very large scale for the first time. 
Each of the works here in the atrium are 1.16 metres across by 1.46 metres high in their oak frames. In the South Gallery, the audio-visual 20-minute loop is six metres across by three metres high, allowing viewers a fully immersive experience in sound and vision. In initial discussions with Simon about this exhibition, I asked him how he would feel about collaborating with another autistic artist. I'd already seen and enjoyed the music and audio work of Dr. Dawn Joy Leong, and I believe that Simon's visual images and Dawn's responses to those images in sound would make for a compelling audiovisual exhibit. Simon had never collaborated with another artist before, so this was taking him out of his comfort zone and into what was an unfamiliar realm for him of moving images and sound. But he was very open to the idea, and luckily he and Dawn hit it off collegially straight away. Their shared autism meant they understood where the other was coming from. And we began the collaborative process, which because of in-person restrictions had to take place over Zoom. Hasn't Zoom become everybody's new best friend in this time of COVID? We held a series of digital online meetings in August and September, and Simon made the difficult decision for him to choose a small selection of his landscape style images from his vast photographic catalogue. He told Dawn and I where each photo had been taken and what particularly had drawn him into the shot. Some of the images were already cropped and when we saw the images fully opened up, Dawn realised the possibilities of panning a shot across or moving out so that we could take in the full expanse of the visual environment Simon was immersed in. Or in the case of the Perth city landscape, flipping it so that the natural water effect was privileged over the human design. Some of the images were taken from a drone. So this one, for example, is looking down across the sand dunes of Grey near Lancelin. In our online meeting about this image, Simon discussed how he had edited the colour of the photograph to black and white because he wanted more depth and the original wash of orange and white made the image appear flat. Dawn commented on how alive the shapes of the individual sand heaps were, how they seemed to be chasing each other. She heard the bloop bloop of liquid mud. At every stage in this collaboration in our recorded meetings, Dawn comments on what she is hearing through each image. Sometimes there's nothing immediate, but for the most part, as we go through each landscape, one after the other, an auditory sensation will pop up quite literally. For this one, a drone picture again, looking down across the tops of pine trees in Lane Pool Reserve dwelling up, Dawn could hear bells. So that became the main audio theme of this sensory story. Bells rising and falling, looping around and around and around. And when we came to crafting the transition from the previous sensory story to this one, and the points of the tops of the pine trees came into view to the monotone of a bell chime, I realized how like stars they looked and how with a trick of digitally enhanced light, we could create the impression of stars in the night sky morphing gradually into a plantation of trees. That is the beauty of the audiovisual aesthetic. The ability to take a static image, a photograph, and bring it alive through visual trickery and the layering of different supporting sounds 
that creates something more for an audience. A meditative experience, perhaps. The triggering of a memory in the bush or the heightened experience of something that transcends material existence. When you can show that as a six meter by three meter immersive experience in a private room, surrounded by stereo sound, when you create the ambient, when you, you can slow the passage of time and forget that there's a pandemic going on in the world outside, or that you have financial stress or that people don't understand you and enjoy being present in something calming, mesmerizing, extraordinary. This is the curatorial intent behind sense and sensitivity. In my curation also, I've been very conscious of the need for space, not to clutter the South Gallery with many different exhibits or with lots of information that for a neurodiverse audience anyway is hard to take in. Keep it simple, keep it accessible. That has always been the mantra of this exhibition. So if you haven't already been into the South Gallery, you will find welcoming bean bags to sink into, and I hope you'll be able to get out of them, by the way, but that's the immersive experience for you. And you'll find easy access for wheelchairs or for bodies that can't move easily and fluidly through space. To the right, you'll find Dawn Joy's Clement Space with its invitation to lie on a soft, furry rug while goldfish glide and frolic behind you. Caress the pom-poms and luxuriate in tender sensuality. I need to acknowledge Dawn Joy's muse and soulmate, Lucy Like a Charm, the greyhound that Dawn rescued in Australia while she was doing her practice as research PhD at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Lucy, who celebrated her 13th birthday just a few days ago, features throughout this exhibition. It's her heartbeat you can hear as you move through the atrium into the South Gallery. You'll hear her panting breath on the audiovisual loop sensory story number two, which is this one, which is the samphire salt grass at the Creary wetlands near Mandurah. And you can imagine her, as I do, sleeping peacefully with the occasional doggy snore on the soft rug of Clement's space. As you get to know the work of Dawn Joy Leon, you grow to understand the towering significance of Lucy in Dawn's personal and creative lives. Before I end my talk with the poem that underpins sensory story number 10, wooden bridge over the rocks in the water at Augusta, I'd just like to re-emphasize the importance of creativity to both Simon Phillips and to Dawn Joy Leong. How it's, part, how it's part of them like breathing is to all of us. And how research is showing more and more how important creativity and expressing one's creativity is to neurodiverse individuals. And that these creative communications provide other accessible languages for everyone, if only we choose to see and hear them. Which is also why giving neurodiverse artists opportunity like this exhibition is so, so important. Thank you to Curtin University and the John Curtin Gallery for giving Simon Phillips and Dawn Joy Leong this magnificent opportunity to showcase their work. And to conclude my talk, and before we see the artists themselves discuss their creative processes for this creative collaboration, I'd like to read the poem yesterday by Dawn Joy Long, which concludes the audio-visual collaboration.
Yesterday, we were young, sandy beaches, too much sun, long, brisk walks, woods of green, sunburnt faces, melting ice cream. Look, there's you and I. What a time it was. Perhaps you never really understood my dreams, but you were always there for me. And I was too young myself to see what it would cost to really be me. Well, the years would soon tell, but how was I to know? I was young, lost and afraid to let it show. I knew the last time we kissed goodbye that we'd both grow up at last. And you will always have a very special place in my heart because, my dear, yesterday will never be quite in my past. Here today, separate paths. Memory still vivid, though light years away. Love will live in our hearts. Thank you, dear, for yesterday. What got me into photography was uh, when I got my first camera at the age of four, when my parents got it for, I think it was my birthday. A little yellow 35mm camera that came out with me everywhere I went. I've actually still got some of the photos today. I think without having that, I wouldn't have got the interest for photography. But the older I got, I um, was getting more and more interested and, more, and wanted to get more creative. So at the age of 12, I, uh, went, I saved up my pocket money. I got myself a Canon uh, 35mm film camera, uh, SLR. Yeah, it's something really quite special for me and um, really natural and it's something that I don't think I could live without it really in my life. It's helped me in so many levels uh, with my anxiety, my depression, and it's actually saved my life on multiple occasions. When I get too overwhelmed by what goes on around me and um, what I've got to do and I'm not doing my photography at that time, I start to feel a bit suicidal, I start to get really um, in a dark place. But as soon as I get my camera out and just go into location, um, I just lose all of that and I'm just so immersed in what I'm doing. Um, and then when I come back, I'm just fresh and free and I'm focused once again. It really is an expensive form of therapy, but I really enjoy what I do. I love the technical aspect, I love the way I shoot. so. Yeah, and I love, I love learning and trying something new each time. The arts is super important for, for our mental health. You know, we, we saw this in the last year with COVID when we, last couple of years now, with COVID where we're locked down. It's the arts that we reached out for and music and creativity to you know, help us feel connected with all of society. So it is important that we don't disconnect particular groups, you know, who approach the world in different ways. Nature is something that makes me really relaxed and uh, it's something I enjoy. I just feel at one with nature. I try to photograph in busy places like the city and I just feel like I don't belong. It's just so much easier, you know, me going out into the landscape, I can just look and observe and um, just see what's going on and look um, and then capture it with my camera. Where uh, going out um, and meeting people, there's just so many things I've got to do. I've got a mask. Um, masking is uh, basically where I've got to think about how I'm breathing, how I'm standing, uh, um, facial expressions when I'm looking at people as well. So you'll, look, you'll see me, I'm looking right down here on this jetty at this little patch and um, maybe some of the screws here and just looking on there. And that allows me to really think about what I'm saying. Um, but it's just so hard for me to look at someone's face or look at the camera here actually. Um, and um, yeah, I, and then I've also got to, worry, I've got to worry about food and everything. And there's so many layers, so many factors that um, people who are not on the spectrum just take for granted and I wish I had that um, but also I've got sensory issue issues as well. I see things in a, such, a, um, such a fine way and uh, what I see is the individual uh, reeds and the, and the colours. You can, I can see the oranges and I see the bits of yellow just above the water. Um, I can see the way the reeds are actually uh, going off to the side here um, and seeing the way they actually flow. The different shades of green as well. Uh, the contrast and how, and also how the layers are as well. It can be so overwhelming and so tiring, but most of the time it's actually really quite relaxing as well because I'm actually enjoying the scene and seeing it in more detail than how everyone else would see it.
through his photography he can show us the beauty of those things that we might just skim over or, or not even see. So I think, you know, Simon will show us the beauty of the world through photography. I think Dawn will show us the beauty um, through music and, and her creative practice as well. And I think you bring those two things together and you just make magic. We're all pretending to be typical because that's the way humans go. We want, you know, strength in numbers. And so the non-compliant, well, kill. <laughs> We wanted to do a collaboration and we wanted to bring um, an artist uh, and a different art form into the equation. Serendipitously, I just came across the work of Dawn Joy Leong and realised that uh, not only was she an amazing musician and sound artist, but she also had performance sensibilities, which is my art form. Suzanne Inglebritt uh, told me that I'm going to be working with a um, and a composer um, to create the music for my artwork uh, to go along with the slideshow. At first I think Simon and Suzanne heard my songs and so they liked the songs and so they thought that I would use, you know, and I thought so too, but when I saw Simon's photographs, I felt that restricting the response to words, however meaningful the words may be, was not doing the whole experience any justice. Music is sound. So there's music, not just the birds, but there's music in the trees, there's music in the way we shuffle along. You know, everybody's footsteps um, sound different. We knew that we were going to connect and have a story, story tell, and we just got on so well. We kind of like just understood. So I, I don't talk very much with uh, Simon. You know, he's. We, we text by Instagram. She's in Singapore, we're in Perth, but I didn't feel like we got that, sep that um, separation and distance. It just felt natural and felt like she was sitting right next to me, basically. It's very comfortable for me to communicate with a fellow autistic artist because there's not a lot of explaining to do. And I, I'm really bad at explaining. I told her to be free flowing with my work. Just look at it and see how you feel and, and what you get from it. And what she was saying about my images and, uh, um, was just perfect because I, I was just going, yes, 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 that is exactly how I wanted to portray the scene. And she was just getting it and it's just, it's just perfect. I focus on the senses because that's the way I experience the world. That's the way I'd like to communicate. I also found out she was uh, diagnosed later in life, the same as me. So we've all sort of, we've gone through the same, very similar struggles in life. She's really just created the atmosphere and really brought the images to life. Um, so I'm really, I really appreciate her amazing talent and her efforts. I want to invite people um, to partake of my sensory thinking and communication. So I think through my senses, I communicate best through my senses. I think what we can all learn from this is the depth of feeling and sensitivity that neurodiverse art autistic artists have. They just see the world, they hear the world, they sense the world in a far deeper way than, than most of us do. What I've learned from um, the past four years since I got diagnosed was a lot of people, bubble people who are on the spectrum, they, they don't want to take, they allow them to take risks. They want to keep them cocooning in a safe place. And I'm actually glad I was diagnosed later in life because I've done uh, all different types of jobs. And I think without those, uh, those jobs, I wouldn't have um, been able to be the person I am and have the confidence and have the skills in life to do what I'm doing today. There's probably people in this room who don't actually have a diagnosis in autism, probably don't even know they're, they're autistic and um, I quite like that, you know. So one other side of this project is we are looking into, you know, the academic research into neurodiverse creativity and there's <laughs> tons of creativity out there and I guess what, you know, is preventing us from experiencing that or understanding that it's there or going and seeing it in galleries is this stereotype that it does not exist. And through sense and sensitivity, we're showing that it does exist. And people who are neurodiverse can go out and take a picture of something and, you know, see something more in that than, you know, somebody else would. The exhibition almost leverages on work we've done in research in the past. 
because a lot of our research actually focuses on the strengths of autistic individuals, um, identifying those and using those in interventions and programs. So that's kind of part of what the exhibition is about. But I think the more we engage with neurodiverse individuals and, and understand their strengths, we find better, more, more um, effective ways to um, channel their strengths and channel their talents to actually you know, improve their outcomes and, and give them a, a place to shine and, and show the world that what they're really able to do. This whole thing is about diversity. The exhibition is about diversity. So I thought, why not have diversity with my work? And that is what I've done. And the way they see the world, the way they move through the world, might be a little bit different, but you know they've they've now using artistic expression to tell us something about that, and it's really great for us to be able to experience that and that collaboration too. I think that having the opportunity to put on this exhibition through the support of the university and making it happen has been an amazing platform, and and I think you know without the support of Curtin in doing that and giving us the funds to put this exhibition together, we wouldn't be able to tell this really important story that's important to both Simon and Dawn as individuals, but important to our community, important to our research, and important to the way that universities interact with our community. Neurodiversity is just a fact that humanity is made up of many different kinds of minds, and some of the minds are like Simon's and mine. I really hope what me and Dawn have achieved will allow, or will uh, encourage um, other people on the spectrum to get out there and create some works of art. Because it is really an amazing feeling to f have something that you've created that you can actually share with the world. And it's a great way of actually connecting with people as well. It really uh, breaks down those barriers that we often uh, find really challenging. And uh, when you uh, share something that you've created, you have a story you, uh, that you uh, completely forget about, you having autism basically. You feel normal and uh, you can really easily connect with people uh, through art. And it really gives you a really, sense, a really good sense of uh, achievement and it really helps with your self-confidence as well.